The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Hub24 Custodial Services, ABN 94073-633-664, AFSL 239-122, part of the Hub24 Group, and is limited to publicly available information. General advice may be provided by our sponsor, but does not take into account your objectives, financial situation, or needs. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. This series is brought to you by Hub24, one of Australia's leading providers of integrated platform, technology, technology and data solutions to the wealth industry. By working with licensees and advisors, Hub24 is delivering innovative solutions and service excellence that enables you to do business your way, creating efficiencies for your business and value for your clients. These are just some of the reasons why advisors have rated Hub24 number one for value for money and best managed portfolio functionality six years running. Empowering better financial futures together. Find out more at hub24.com.au. Hello and welcome back to this series on enhancing the client experience. In this, the final episode, we start to nerd out on the technology as we hear from Greg Hansen, Senior Business Strategy Manager at Hub24. Greg has a great understanding of the role that technology plays in delivering a world-class advice experience, and we go deep into all sorts of concepts that will shape the way you provide financial advice in the future. This is a great way of rounding out the series, so lock your focus in on this episode with Greg Hansen. Thanks for joining me, Greg Hansen. Thanks, Fraser. Pleasure to be here. Fantastic to have you along. And uh, we're talking all things client experience. We're talking about data. We're talking about technology, many of which are my favorite things. Uh, before we get into that conversation, let's uh, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing at the moment. I've been in and around advice for a very long time. I've uh, worked for product manufacturers and platforms. I've worked uh, in licensees and national management roles. I've run a uh, business consultancy. Um, I had a crack at a startup uh, looking at pr- providing uh, advice to people retiring without much money, which is a lot of fun. Uh, Now working for Hub24 and uh, looking specifically at how we uh, can help advisors uh, talk to more clients, um, provide advice more efficiently, and really looking at uh, all those things that uh, help advisors provide more advice to more people. Wow, you've been everywhere, man. Yeah, it's been good. I've been around (laughs) around a long time. Well, you're the perfect person to talk to about this because uh, you've, you've seen it from, like you said, a, st- a small startup point of view, from the technology piece, from the uh, from the consulting, the advice piece, having those conversations. Um, let, we're, we're talking about client experience. We're talking about technology. T- tell us about um, your thoughts on how important that uh, that client experience is in in the developing of sort of a long term advice relationship. Yeah, it, look. <laughs> There's a lot of focus on technology, but the real focus needs to be, I think, on the, the client experience and the relationship the advisor has with the client. We're very passionate about the, the value that advice has uh, and the, the value that it brings to people in having that advice relationship. Um, we can talk about technology and different ways it can add to the client experience, but at the heart of it, it needs to be supporting the advisor uh, to help the, help the client articulate their goals and deliver a plan to uh, to meet those goals and then monitor that plan in an ongoing sense. So from the role of technology, I think, is to support that. How do we make that more efficient? How do we help advisors have more of those face-to-face conversations? Um, And how do we support them, increase their capacity, uh, increase their ability to add value to more people? I'm chatting to an advisor the other day about the value that he adds to, to clients. I think his perspective was his main value is to help them avoid doing dumb things. So that's uh, <laughs> yeah. There's there's definitely a tangible and intangible value of advice, isn't there? And uh, we you know we always like to put the tangible values down, but often we like to lean into. I think you know the clients feel a bit more like they're getting that intangible value. 
Yes, definitely. So I think technology is, is, has an incredibly important part to play, but I think the, the real role of it is to support that advisor conversation. Yep. Yeah, fantastic. Now, uh, um, if, we, uh, if we if we get into a little bit of the technology and start talking about um, the client experience and how this has happened in the past, let's let's open up some of that that little can of worms and talk about how you know where this journey has come from. Because I think um, you know yeah, we, we've all gone from using paper files and paper based uh, you know information and unstructured data, and we'll get into more of that structured conversation later. But uh, unstructured information and then we tried to overlay this technology and and, and sort of t- talk to us about what you where you see that journey has come from oh, look i think a great example of where it's come from is platforms you know go back uh, many many years and i've been around the industry for many many years and people used to fill out paper application forms and have a variety of uh, people calling calling fund managers for, for unit prices and uh, and holdings and the like and uh, assembling everything themselves Platform is a great example of something that came along to make that whole process more efficient to, uh, as I said, enable the advisors to spend more time face-to-face with clients and uh, deal, having those conversations that are really important. But it's also interesting to me that uh, different tools pop up all the time and that some of these tools uh, have great value and are, and are useful for advisors and useful for clients. But over time, there's a proliferation of these tools uh, and they tend to add complexity to an advice practice because there's no one single source of truth. And so if you add more tools, sometimes you add complexity in terms of managing those tools. So you might have a CRM and and some planning software, you might have some email campaign software, some document storage businesses, uh, calculators, illustrative software and the like. And so you you accumulate these things over time because they're good for for your client and your client experience, but they can add complexity to your back office. Uh, and complexity to the way you manage data and uh, and manage your client relationships. Yeah, you mentioned, uh, I want to get into this tools conversation a little bit more because I think it's important. And when we think about the past and the history of where technologies come from um, in, in this user experience, it was like there was a shiny tool. It's great. It's excellent. We want to use it. But every single one of those tools relied on the structure of the data to be there in some form. And every single tool built, built their own storage facility or database where they would store that data right and so the problem i guess with many tools is that conversation of many storage devices were all with different you know cups of information definitely i totally agree i think that is still the case you get some really useful tools and they might store some client data that's useful in, in some circumstances but then that doesn't get transferred to other tools that you have and so all of a sudden you've got multiple points of data entry uh and so that that data quality becomes really difficult to manage. Yeah, it's, um, and, and you're right. The, the more tools you stack on top of each other, and the more little pots of uh, to- pots of data that you have, the the, the more you're going to struggle. And, and and the technology that was supposed to speed you up actually ends up slowing you down. That's right, and that that has a lot of uh, implications for the way advisors run their practices for their back office stuff. But it also has a lot of implications for licensees as well. Uh, you know, one of the one of the costs that continues to increase is the is the cost of licensee services, and partly because that's uh, the sub- subsidies that existed have been stripped away. But those costs are increasing at the same time, and so. Uh, we spent a lot of time with licensees in the past, and their uh, their main the main problem that they had uh, was a lack of access to quality data. And if they've got a lack of access to quality data, it means the licensee services all become very highly manual uh, and relatively inefficient um, and expensive and difficult. Yeah, Greg, I think one of the I think one of the the things around that advisors have found over the last few years is a lot of collecting data and collecting signatures from clients and um, in a fairly unstructured way, like a lot of wet signatures have been required. And I think that's been something that has, um, uh, you know, hurt the relationship with the client experience. Yeah, definitely. Collecting you know, the wet signatures and, and the, the, the need to have clients acknowledge uh, different different uh, forms and, and the like, I think, is a, is a big drain on productivity for advisors. But the, whole, the whole data collection piece is a real problem. Uh, I think really a, a lot of clients struggle to uh, aggregate their data um, and find out uh, or just find out how much money that they have in superannuation and how much money they have in different shares direct holdings and the like so um, that the the signing of forms is definitely a problem but I think that collection of data is a real issue that uh, needs to be addressed as well yep yeah now let's um let's talk about some of the uh, obviously you know we, we're, we're talking about advice firms is there anything you're seeing advice firms doing really well in the space and, and leading the way when it comes to how they um, how they set their minds and what they're looking at when it comes to, you know, 
the now and how they're running their businesses now? That's a really interesting question because I think that the pressures on financial advice businesses are different to, the, to what they used to be. You've only got you know, the, the latest figures are there's sort of 15,500 uh, advisors. And so the advisors that we speak to are, are finding much less pressure on growing their business and having new people come through the door because they are having people come to them and approach them at, at the whole time. Their pressures tend to be more, from our perspective, about efficiency and capacity and how you provide more advice to more people uh, and provide more value. So what are those organisations doing that they're, they're doing well? They, uh, they're systemising their business. They uh, And this, this is probably nothing new. Uh, you know, They're very clear about their value proposition and your previous speakers have spoken very eloquently about the, the power of getting that value proposition right and their client experience right. So they're spending a lot of time making sure that the clients feel confident and looked after, then they know where they're going and they have a good experience in dealing not only with the, with the advisor, but that entire practice as well. And then it's yeah. about it's about uh, managing managing systems and processes and managing data in the, in, the, uh, in the back office and making sure there's an efficiency there that can be transferred to, to client relationships. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. Uh, there's certainly um, the market has certainly shrunk, and there's a lot of people knocking on doors, and uh, and uh, there is a lot of pain around the concept of how do we service all these individuals that need to be looked after, and how to provide advice to many people. Um, if we if we think about uh, if we think about this from other markets, you know, we uh, we sort of done this for the last speakers as well. We sort of thought about the fact that you know we come from a financial advice space, and it's very easy for us to comment. But um, you know, you've got a, a, a vast background and 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 thinking about things in a different way. T- tell us what you're thinking about from other markets and how they might be using data and, and technology to really improve client experiences. Uh, well, I think one, one, one good example is, is, is in our industry, but it's in, in overseas, uh, from an overseas market. We had a look at um, different ways that digital advice providers have engaged, um, have engaged clients overseas. And it's something we're interested in, in seeing how can, that can be applied to the Australian market. So there's a business overseas uh, called Focus Solutions. It's owned by Aberdeen, um, and they spend a lot of time on digital engagement. But they they spend. It's quite a specific thing that they do. They work with businesses that have very large client bases, and they look at ways to make sure that those those businesses stay relevant and connected to the clients that they have. Now they can't all afford face to face advice, so they've built a series of experiences to make sure that uh, that those clients are connected. And when there's an advice event that happens, they are the logical point of contact for those businesses. So they worked very heavily with businesses such as Brew and Dolphin and Skipton Building Society. Uh, they've built dashboards to help those clients have a basic understanding of their financial situation and some of the things that they can do with their finances. Um, and they've been a great source of, of leads for those financial advice businesses. And in fact, in the Brew and Dolphin, Society, uh, Brew and Dolphin example, they're, they're a high net worth business and they had a lot of children of uh, those clients, obviously, who needed help. And so they introduced, introduced this digital advice process and this dashboard and, and the, the various calculators and, and uh, experiences that underpin that. And the feedback from their high net worth advisors, uh, clients, is that they would like access to those tools as well. Yeah, that's really interesting because um, you sort of think about it from the intergenerational wealth transfer or getting, you know, the children of the of your existing clients on uh, to this process, or being able to provide something for the younger generations coming through. But uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Tell us a little bit more about those tools and, and how they work. Yeah, I think one of the important parts here is that they're not trying to establish brand new relationships. They are either for existing existing clients who who once had a, a fee paying relationship and didn't anymore, or the children who were introduced by their parents. So they're not trying to establish these relationships from scratch. So the whole client acquisition um, piece. Was not it was not really where the value of that software sat. Um, what they're very good at doing is once they're introduced, to um, provide some a, a dashboard, and then it's 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 basically what is your biggest problem, and how do we help you set uh, how do we help you solve that biggest problem, and then how do we help you solve the next biggest problem? So for some, it was saving for a a goal. It might be a holiday or a car or a, or a house, and how do we help you? Um, choose some investments and manage your cash flow in a way that's going to help you achieve your goal. And obviously, you've got some insurance journeys as well. How much insurance do you need? Uh, and then uh, retirement savings journeys. Uh, and one journey that we were particularly interested in that I thought, thought worked really well was to start with 
a simple pension estimate. Uh, how much how much pension am I going to get? Now, in the UK, what's interesting about that is that it's a standard pension. Everyone gets the same. <laughs> but, uh, but you still ran a calculator and, and uh, said this is the pension that you could get. And if you enter more information, then it could give you a, an estimate of your um, – Expect or an expectation of your income in retirement, and then it gave you the ability to talk to someone about that. And are there ways to improve that? Is that enough? Those sorts of basic questions. Yeah, we talked about this in some of the other episodes. The concept of trackers and dashboards, and and just having that uh, that focus, and doesn't necessarily have to be complicated. It's just it's just about bringing the attention to the direction you're heading and keeping focus. Oh, that's exactly right. I, I think what's what's interesting about that is what do you want the technology to do for you. What's the problem you're trying to solve? And I think where I haven't seen a lot of success in digital, digital providers engaging new clients, but I have seen a lot of success in helping engaged clients keep up with their journey and get information and get education and make sure that they're on the right track. Yeah. And do you think that's where the, the key will be to technology in the future, just making sure we help engaged or clients that already sort of understand the value of of advice? It's probably just that I've seen that much, uh, I've seen that work much more successfully than other models, uh, particularly the models that I've seen in the UK and the US. Obviously, there are some some examples in the US of uh, organisations that have been good at attracting new clients and engaging new client relationships. Uh, I think though, in the Australian market currently, I think there's a greater need for uh, for those sorts of tools to help people stay on track once they have a uh, once they have a, an established relationship. Yep. And uh, and as we and speaking of Australia, as we record this, we've sort of under the uh, we've had some information about the quality of advice review. Uh, nothing's official, of course, yet. Um, it, it might be by the time people listen to this. But uh, tell us what your thoughts are around that, and and, and that this sort of digital advice process could fit well into what the proposals are for quality of advice. Definitely. Look, I think there's some really exciting uh, potential. There's some really exciting potential for professional advisors if some of the proposals are accepted. So one of the, some of the things that I think are of most interest are uh, the ability for professional advisors to use their judgment when working out uh, an advice process when a new client comes in the door. So without that prescribed process under the the best interest duty and all the steps that go with it, uh, I think the expectation is that advisors will be able to Make, use their judgment to decide how much information do I need to collect and what do I need to do to be able to demonstrate that this is good advice. So there's sort of two issues there. One is, one is what does the client experience look like? I think there's going to be a lot more flexibility about the way advisors go uh, in providing and certainly, and certainly uh, delivering advice to, new, to, to clients. But then there's another, uh, another matter that needs to be addressed is, is how do you provide the evidence that good advice has been provided and you've got all the documentation to prove that? Yeah, I, I definitely think you're right there with regards to some of those digital forms with um, you know, demonstrating the value uh, of the advice has been there. And, and once you've done that, um, you know, I like the idea of, uh, of, of advisors being able to actually provide a financial plan rather than an SOA. Someone, someone will probably... have something that someone will actually read. <laughs> yeah, something that might be a little bit more engaging and, and, and visual and, and easier to understand because there might be, you know, certain quite clear uh, graphs around the concept of this is where you're going, this is the direction, this is the, how the strategy works. It's a great point. I think if you're looking at uh, the role of technology, I think there's one great potential for, for technology is to, to, assuming those things are accepted and, and uh, they, they come into legislation, then there's a great ability or a great potential for advice to be delivered completely differently. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I'm definitely on that on board that train. Um, with regards to uh, the and, and now we talked a little bit about data and we talked about structured and unstructured data. I wanted I wanted to dive into that and get it get a bit uh, nerdy if we can. Um, talk to us about. Uh, let's start with just the basic of what you consider to be unstructured data and what you consider to be structured data and and how we transfer some of that unstructured data to be to have more structure. So think about uh, what an advisor does currently in their practice and all those documents uh, that uh, that demonstrate the demonstrate the value of the advice and demonstrate the advice has been given. So it's things like file notes and statements of advice, fee, fee disclosure statements. Um, you've got uh, a whole range of documents that sit in unstructured formats, emails and the like. And so. Uh, the problem, and we, we first came across this problem when talking to licensees, that's all the documents that, that, that they want access to, but they sit in completely different places per advisor. So 
what uh, what they were talking about was wanting to make sure that the advisors had flexibility in the way they did business. So advisors, they're self-employed business people. They have their own preferences. They have their own client bases. They're all unique and they have different ideas about which tools they want to use to manage that client experience. But what it meant is that you've got data stored everywhere. <laughs> and so the, uh, the, uh, the licensee had no way of seeing, licensees had no way of seeing what was actually provided to a client. So think about it, for example, where a, a statement of advice was prepared in X plan. They met with a client. They wanted a few changes made. It was changed in Word. It was stored in a CRM. So all of a sudden, you've got a whole range of different, uh, different documents stored in different places, and the licensees didn't know what went where. So we've been working very hard working on a machine learning uh, with a machine learning business to turn all that unstructured data into structured data. So now we've uh, generated that ability and where they've been really successful is choosing a small amount of documents and being very highly targeted at uh, making sure their accuracy rates are really uh, are very, very high. So at the moment, there's there's one machine that has a look at all the data that comes in overnight from a licensee and splits those into 23 different document types, so statements of advice and FDSs and file notes and the like. And then you've got more machines or mach- machine learning engines that have a look at, for example, a statement of advice and will extract the name of the client, the name of the advisor and the investment recommendations and the fees and the like. Uh, and similarly for FDSs, look at well, is there a signature on the page? Uh, and it's turning all that unstructured data into structured data. Now, the first use case that we're, that we're concentrating on is helping licensees then, but now they've got access to structured data, they, the quality and efficiency of their services should increase, which means that they should be able to provide a better service with better quality at a lower cost. And that can be transferred to advisors uh, so that they're, again, getting a better experience from their licensees at a lower cost. Um, and they can be confident that all their compliance uh, compliance measures are met. Where we really want to get to is working with a couple of these licensees is the idea of proactive compliance. So I've got a, a child at high school and before he, assi- he submits his assignments, he's got to go through a, a uh, plagiarism check. <laughs> he, he doesn't always yes. pass, it's quite like. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's that sort of concept, you know, if you've got a statement of advice, can you run it through the machine and get an instantaneous response to say, yes, we're, you know, from a licensee perspective or from a professional standards perspective, we're comfortable that this uh, can be issued and then you can manage that by exception. Yeah, it's an interesting process. I'm, I want to get into this machine learning concept, but before we, uh, with the, the amount of files you need before a machine to actually learn. Um, but yeah, it, it's, a, it's a really good idea, isn't it, to have that proactive compliance and to be able to say, and even if the machine's not picking it up, you know, it doesn't pick up the, something from the document. It's about going, oh, yes, it was in there on, you know, and going back and be able to tick those boxes off and, and then approve. Um, tell us about that concept of data because it's certainly not within the realms of one advice firm or even one licensee to be able to turn around and go, I've got enough data to teach a machine how to do this. So it's one of the advantages of working with licensees. Um, and, and one of the great powers of the, or the great potential for this machine learning is that you don't need advice to be provided in a specific format for the machine to be effective. So you can train the machine over a period of time. So um, we're interested in how we apply this and make this available to fintech providers as well. So one of our uh, observations is that there's a range of great fintechs in the market, but some of them require um, forms in a specific format in order for their systems to be effective. Now, if we can extract that data and feed those forms to the fintechs, then it means that uh, there's a greater potential for them to, for them to be successful. Um, but you're right, in order for these things to work and for order for the machine learning to be successful, you need a high accuracy rate. And so uh, working with licensees, we can feed a number of, uh, of statements of advice through from that licensee, from different advisors and different practices, and train the machine. Um, and that's really where the, all the hard yards uh, are. But if you get it right, it becomes enormously powerful. And in the cases of statements of advice and fee disclosure statements, we've been able to demonstrate that we can um, look at statements of advice from a variety of uh, – and FDSs from a variety of uh, – licensees from a variety of practices and retain that accuracy level. 
Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And I like the idea of working with the fintech providers because you're right. Because if everybody's got a machine they're trying to teach, it's uh, it doesn't work. It's uh, but if, if everybody's teaching the same machine, it makes more sense. And you know, there's a couple of, to add to that. What it means is if you train the machine, then you can actually run the machine past all the statements of advice that have been generated in the past as well. So you get access to immediately to a much greater source of information and data. And then you can make that available to, to fintechs. We think there's, um, we've got a great part to play in assisting and enabling fintechs to be more successful. Uh, what Hub24 has a capability of doing is, is providing that data and providing that data infrastructure. What we're not going to be doing is building the fintech tools. Yep. But if we can yeah. provide that data to more fintechs and make them more successful, then we think that's a valuable part to play. So this comes back down to the conversation we we're having earlier around the, the cup of data for each tool. Um, just having one, you know, let's go with the data lake or the data storage facility or the factory, or whatever you want to call it, the warehouse. Um, one zone, one source of truth that tools can use to dip into rather than having to build their own database. That's exactly right. Yep. That if, if we can provide a data infrastructure and that people can trust the data, then we think there's a, there's a whole range of different ways you can go with trusted data. Now, what some of the things that we're using it for um, is for you know things like the present functionality. Uh, we were told by advisors that they really struggled to provide, to generate uh, reviews in a timely fashion. And so uh, one of the things that we can do with trusted data is help advisors tailor, construct and tailor a review document uh, in a matter of minutes rather than a matter of hours as, a, as one example of things you can do with trusted data. I, I want to get into this concept, go a little bit deeper on this if I can, because the SOAs may or may not be um, the thing that we do for the next 10 years. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but if we've got that all those SOAs from the past and we've got that concept of what is good advice based on the past, will we then have a benchmark of what good advice could be in the future that we could then present to as the benchmark of good advice, because that's something that's being debated at the moment. What is good advice? Definitely. I think it's a, it's a really good observation. I think that there's a lot of power in that. Um, I think, obviously, advisors will be excited about the flexibility that they would have not having to provide a statement of advice. From a licensee perspective, it probably makes them really nervous because they've got a, a system that they need to follow at the moment, and so they can build systems around the different steps of the process. But if you don't have that system and you just need to demonstrate good advice – then how do you do that? But I think tools like this, uh, and with access to, to the data from years past, then you can then use that information to construct systems that licensees will be comfortable with, that it retains the ability for the advisor to have some flexibility about the way they provide advice. Now, more than that as well, I think we can use some of the tools that we have to prove the the, the, the uh, benefits of advice. So, for example, if a statement of advice or a document is issued that captures someone's current position with recommendations, then you know those recommendations might be executed via Hub24. We've got access to their prop, their, the situation that they had, their goals and their their attitudes and the like. That could all be captured. Um, and we're interested to see how we use all that data in an ongoing sense to prove the value of advice. Can we use that to to um, to not only focus on the emotional benefits of advice in terms of peace of mind and confidence and, and the like, but also what are the hard numbers? How do you demonstrate that uh, advice, how much advice, uh, how, how valuable advice is? Oh, I'd love to see that. I'd love to see that the fact that, as you said, that proof of whatever the, the structure of the advice being provided in, in, our, in my in my brain, that's a financial plan. Um, but uh, but being able to say, you know, this, there's a better position, and without you know using the better position statement, but that you're in a better position both logically for dollars and also emotionally, and just having those two scales to say, yes, better off. Even like with insurance. Uh, insurance is always, uh, you know, be one of those things that you go, well, you spend money on a premium and if you don't claim, you're worse off, aren't you? Uh, but then, but then the peace of mind out trumped, you know, of, of having that in place, uh, you know, outweighs that, that better position. So I think, um, I think, uh, yeah, being able to have those two scales would, and, and as you mentioned before, like that, that process around, um, a dashboard or, or a, a tracker to be able to demonstrate where that's up to. 
And some of that, some of that is is you know it might be investment related, for example, but a lot of it's going to be behaviourally related. You know, how much money were they saving before? What was their cash flow like? Uh, what's their cash flow like after? And you can demonstrate that they might might be in a situation where they they're now appropriately insured, and so the cash flow has changed, but because of behavioural change, you've uh, you're saving more money or you're in a more financially secure position than you used to be, because you've changed the way that you you're managing money. Yeah, I think uh, I think this is certainly the key to you know that, that better advice conversation in the future, being able to then demonstrate using that structured data format uh, and some smart dashboards around the concept of just you know this is exactly where you're you know it, the the value of our advice. Exactly right. Exactly right. Everyone, everyone who has received advice, well, not everyone, almost everyone who has received advice appreciates the value and understands the value of it. We need to be, do a better job of uh, communicating that to new and younger clients. Yep. How do you, how do you see this looking in the future with regards to the client experience and 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 they're coming through? Do they open an app on their phone? Is that what you're thinking? But probably in the in the longer term, yes. There are some things that we're trying to solve in the shorter term uh, before we get to that point. Um, and from an advisor's perspective, the two things that we're concentrating on are how do you provide a single view of wealth for the advisor and the client, um, and how do you provide uh, one way of doing business for the advisor. Now, there's this two issues that. Uh, other people then, Jason Entwistle within Hub24 speaks very eloquently about is, is the original concept of, of, um, of platforms that has never been realised. Um, but we think with, that, with the right data infrastructure, uh, then you can provide a single view of wealth. And that might be across, uh, obviously, custodially held assets within the platform, but non-custodially held assets as well. It might be direct property or bank accounts and credit cards and the like. Um, we should be able to provide a single view of wealth efficiently and easily that uh, advisors and clients can work with. And if you've got that, then by extension, you should be able to build tools that manage that uh, that entire client portfolio. Uh, so it might be about rebalancing or fees or corporate actions and the like. So how do you uh, increase the efficiency of the way that the services that an advisor provides are delivered? So. Shorter term, I think we're focusing on some of those sorts of issues, but longer term, how do you then use that data infrastructure is really, um, a- again, where some of the where fintechs and, and advisors get involved. If you've got access to trusted data, then what can you do with it? And I think the ability to uh, generate apps and create unique client experiences are something that, that is going to be possible uh, and really interesting if you've got access to trusted data. Yeah, and that uh, that source, that single source of truth, and I like the idea of a single view of wealth. But obviously, that and as you were just sort of saying, that it's not that doesn't exist in one moment, like our past documents have always been. It exists uh, every day, and in, in, with the behaviors and tracking and changes, and, and the way that people change their behaviors, and um, and then the ability to to be able to introduce for an advisor, be able to get a notification saying, "Hey, there's a couple of strategies that might help uh, at this time. It's time to to um, to talk to the client." The provision of proactive advice. I think it's something that everyone, all advisors would love to be able to do. Uh, exactly right. Imagine being able to go to, to, go to a, a, a client and say, look, I've, I've identified this opportunity for you in this specific circumstance. If you make these changes, then you're going to be X better off or, or this much closer to your goal. You know, are you, are you, do you want to proceed? So, Greg, uh, one of the things that I um, I love this question, but because it sort of uh, you know talks about the concept of you know we we always build and reiter- reiterate upon the, the existing stuff that we've already got, and we try and make things better and better and better. And sometimes we have a crappy system and we make it fast, and we take a crappy system to the client faster. Um, but if we could start from scratch and think about um, you know like creating advice, creating an advice firm um, of the future, you know, where, where would we start and what we do to making sure that the clients are brought along for the journey and, and, and what would be the ultimate in your mind if we were just sort of redesigning this from scratch? It's such, it's such a good question. It's such an interesting question. And I'd love to be able to say, you know, something mind-bogglingly amazing that it's going to change the way people think about advice, but I'm not. Because I think, I think the answer is just in the basics. I think the answer is, and it's very highly aligned with some of the things that your previous guests have been saying. What's your value proposition? You know, what's your target market? What do you, how do you segment your, how do you segment properly? What, what services you're providing at what cost? And so the basics of, of business planning, and I think uh, those things have been spoken about a long time because advisors, in my experience, across the board are very technically very gifted, um, um, but not all of them 
uh, excel at, at running a business. So they became financial advisors because they're interested in financial advising and talking to people. Um, different advisors have different levels of, of ability to, 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 to run a business. I think the other thing that we've got to acknowledge is that we operate within such a structured regulatory environment. Um, I think that's one of the things, one of the reasons that people are interested in the potential of a quality advice review, because if you change the rules, you change the way the game is played. And we've seen that really clearly with FOFA and and the Royal Commission. You change the way that the industry, uh, well, you've changed the rules and you change the, the structure of the entire industry. We've seen the, uh, the the major institutions disappear from the industry of the rise of boutiques and privately owned businesses. Um, it looks completely different to the way it used to because you've changed the rules. Now, if you change the rules again with quality advice review, I think we, we, we can expect such a, a fundamental change but coming back to your original question, um, those rules matter. So it's really difficult to to um, provide a system, a, a service and an experience that's really different to what's currently there because it's so highly regulated. These are the things that you must do in order to provide advice. This is what the, your, you know, the advisor must look like this and the advice must look like this. Um, so I think it just comes back to business basics, value proposition, segmentation, servicing and pricing, ideal client, target marketing, those sorts of things. Yeah, no, knowing your costs and knowing where to, to cut them back. I want I want to talk about the idea of cost because I think all of the things that we've talked about, um, and it, you know, is able to in the long term reduce the cost uh, of financial advice. <laughs> Played golf with my brother and a couple of mates a little while ago, and it was such a it was this does have a financial services uh, point to it, but it was like uh, we all have have workarounds for things that we're doing. So my my brother will aim left and hit it hard because he knows he's going to slice it, right? So I've got another mate who's got 400 different uh, changes to his swing because he knows that he can't hit it straight unless he does these things. I can't putt to save my life, so I'm trying a new technique uh, every day. But it's it, none of us are addressing the fundamental issues that we need, you know, we need to go back and work on a fundamental s- swing. So all the things that we've been speaking about, I think what's what's the fundamental issue? fundamental issue is that advice is really expensive. The, the cost of advice exceeds what most people are, are willing or able to pay, and it, it is getting worse. Cost of advice has always been expensive, and so there's always been a range of subsidies that mean that people can get advice. Those subsidies have been stripped away, and now we're seeing advice costs, of, you know, conservatively three and a half, more like $5,000. And so, Fewer and fewer people are accessing initial, and fewer and fewer people uh, are accessing ongoing financial advice, and it's a bad outcome. It's been recognised by the government. They're looking; they've uh, instituted someone to look at increasing access and affordability. We need to look at ways of reducing the cost of providing financial advice, increasing the efficiency of providing financial advice, and making sure more people get it. Yep, and with that efficiency. Hopefully, we can throw that effectiveness piece in there as well, which is the uh, really the the client engaging and being involved in, not just becoming cheaper. Definitely, definitely. I think uh, some of the again, if you've got access to to trusted data, there's a whole range of services and tools that you can employ to make sure people are getting value. And how then how do you demonstrate that value? Um, yeah, we've seen that the power of financial advice to fundamentally change people's lives. We, we need to make sure that more people can access that. Yep. Yep. Now, what I, I want to talk about these advice firms that are existing at the moment. That um, they're busy. They've got a lot of work on. They're, they're doing. You know, they're they're, they're trying to improve things in, incrementally. What What are your thoughts around those practices? What should they be and can be doing to maybe some quick wins or just some some concepts around what they should be thinking about when it comes to um, both the digital, uh, the client experience, and the use of the data in their practices. Well, what are the, <laughs> I'll get to, to data and, and uh, data in a moment. But one of the the, the great increases in efficiencies that we've seen is for the use of managed portfolios. That's a piece of technology that uh, that a number of advisors have adopted to great uh, to great success. I think I saw a statistic the other day from investment trends that the average advisor adds 16 about 16 hours a week or something through the use of managed portfolios. So the advisors that we're speak, speaking to uh, reflecting that they have a better client experience, the clients have a better investment outcome. Um, and they're saving time and money and effort through the use of professionally managed managed portfolios. Yep, that's that's definitely one way of doing it. Any any other tips around um, you know technology that people can think about in their practices? 
Look, I think for us, uh, it's not so much about tools for us. It's about how we how we create that data infrastructure so that advisors are in control of the tools that they use. We want advisors to be able to use the tools and, and uh, the, the, the latest and greatest that come to market without adding all that complexity in the, in the back of their practice. So if we can create that data infrastructure, then how do we make sure that those tools can plug easily in and out of, of your data infrastructure? Um, that means that clients still get the, the right client outcome and the client experience that the advisor wants to generate, but you don't create enormous degrees of complexity in the back office. Yep. Now, I wanted to quickly touch on the um, uh, the client data right or open banking from a data point of view as well. Um, one of the things I wanted to cover in today's episode was that conversation around you know, uh, as a as a large platform, you're you're gathering this data, and and how will advice firms be able to use that in the, in the future with when it comes to um, that open banking concept? So, uh, I think there's enormous in- uh, efficiencies to be gained in the initial collection of uh, of information and collection of data. You know, we've t- we spoke previously about the fact that it is really difficult for an advisor to get a hold of all the relevant information that a client has, and hopefully that would make it much easier, which would reduce the the stress and the and the cost and the time involved in that initial advice process. And then, from an ongoing and uh, ongoing uh, relationship perspective access to that sort of data should help the advisor to be able to provide greater value to clients in terms of managing their behavior and demonstrating value over a period of time. So you've got much better access to uh, the client's entire financial situation and should be able to manage that much uh, much more easily, which means that you should be able to um, help them make the changes necessary for them to achieve their goals. Yep. Fantastic. And uh, as you mentioned earlier, you've been working on that machine learning part um, of getting that unstructured data and destruction. Do, are you able to give us a bit more of a sneak peek of what's happening behind the scenes with regards to um, what that might look like for advisors to be able to, to, to be able to dip into that concept of having that all their data in one place? Yeah, so it's a really good question. At the moment, we've, we've been very focused on licensee outcomes. So how do you how do you improve the effectiveness and efficiency of what they're doing at a, at a lower cost? But the point is that then you've got access to all that data and then what, what do you do with it then? And, and we haven't turned our mind, we're very keen to turn our minds to what can you do for advisors by having access to all that data. Now, the first, the first very simple thing you can do is provide benchmarking. So we could benchmark uh, advisors across different geographies, across different, uh, li- across different licensees and help, um, help advisors um, recognise where the greatest efficiency gain within their practice might be. So if you want to go to the next level of, of, of profitability and value in your practice, then what are those high value activities that you could be doing uh, and helping them understand what other people are, are doing? So that's that's an example of an advisor of an advisor outcome. Another example is to use that data for a single view of wealth. You know, if you can, if you can rather than try and collate all the information that you have and construct reconstruct their client portfolio in a third party in, an, in another third party system then how do you make sure or how do you give an advisor the ability to have a single view of wealth for their client in all circumstances at all times and then if you've got that then you should be able to um, manage their entire portfolio more easily as well I love I love the concept of um, being able to aggregate that data and, and and have a collective view of what is good advice, a collective view of what was a good strategy for that situation. You know, what do the majority of advisors in the country do in that situation? I, I love that being able to concept to be able to create that benchmark to say this is appropriate because, you know. 95% of advisors around the country would recommend this same strategy at the same point in time. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting one, isn't it? It's, <laughs> advice is difficult because you can have two identi- clients in, in identical situations, but the advice that you would give them would be different because their attitudes are different and their goals and objectives are different. So, But to have that sense of uh, of this is what good advice has looked like in other circumstances, I think is really valuable for advisors and clients. But it also means it also means that for advice to be really valuable, it needs to be tailored. And how do you make sure that advisors are able to tailor their advice? Mm, it's, it's, there's so many different uh, proof points, isn't there, to try and capture? That's right. Uh, Greg, thanks so much for coming on and chatting to us today about the client experience, around data and technology, and how all that overlays and works together. Um, if somebody wanted to reach out to one of your team, probably what's what's the best way for them to reach out? 
via our BDMs, via the Hub24 BDMs is going to be the best way. Um, all, all the contact details are on the website, but uh, they're very keen to talk to you. So I'd say, yes, please get in t- contact with one of our BDMs. Fantastic, Rick. Thank you so much for coming along, giving us a bit of an insight into what's going on behind the scenes uh, and in your mind, which has been uh, an amazing experience. I appreciate you uh, coming on and sharing your ideas. I uh, really appreciate you having me on, Fraser. Thank you. Thank you very much. 